Now, you and I were talking about a couple of statistics beforehand. Uh, state of California has approximately 45 million people, slightly more than that, I think. Uh, I, I use the number of 40 million. 40 million, okay. So the California state senators, your uh, district, you represent in excess of a million people, correct? Right, Very approximately close. a million, yeah. yeah. Now, I mean, that's actually more than a congressional representative on a proportionate basis. And so as, as an individual representative, you have an incredibly diverse um, uh, group of individuals that you represent. You highlighted an area that is of mutual concern, um, mental health, right? Mm -hmm. Contributes significantly to the homeless challenges that we face here in California. You sponsored, or if, I'm, if I understand correctly, there was a, 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 an attempt to build a mental health facility in Orange County that you've spoken about. Can you share what you see as a model for how we can get some of that stuff done, how we can actually start to fix it? Orange County uh, is blessed with some wonderfully successful people. And traditionally, very bright, smart people will have a child that has schizophrenia or is bipolar or has depression. It's uh, sort of the family secret in Orange County. Uh, so uh, we've been working uh, on this dynamic from the ground up, sort of gotten organic. There are a lot of people that are making substantial contributions to form a nonprofit called uh, Be Well OC or Mind OC. And it has already been able to work on building a, a housing trust, which we did legislation on two years ago. We have been able to find a facility in the city of Orange on Anita Drive, where we can build a $65,000 uh, $65, office complex. Square foot. What did I say? You said a dollar. Oh, <laughs> no, 65000 no, $65,000 anywhere. Yeah, 65000 yeah. square feet, thank you, Mike. And, and so that will help uh, those with mental illness and, and, and get them hopefully through an assisted outpatient treatment program to get the right medication, right dosage, and help them mainstream again. And so it's, it's sort of uh, an operation that's hoping to look for two other locations. Uh, then we would at least have opportunities for people to, to kind of get back to normal. Mental illness is going to be with you for the rest of your life. It's just the way it is. Schizophrenia, is, there's no cure. But you can compensate. We have a law professor at USC that has schizophrenia, but she medicates and she understands that she's got to stay on that medication to function properly. The minute she starts reducing or eliminating her, her, her dosage, she has uh, psychotic episodes, right? So she, you just gotta you know, go with the program and then, and then find your niche in life and we can help people, but we don't. We let them just walk around and have their psychotic episodes on the street and scare housewives that are trying to buy groceries at the grocery store. They don't even wanna go anymore because of what they're encountering. So we're trying, we tried to uh, expand the definition of Gravely disabled, uh, just uh, just had it killed last month. SB 640, which would have uh, allowed for more of an involuntary hold, so we can keep you more than a, what a 5150 would do by keeping you for 72 hours. We could do maybe a little longer, so we can find that right medication to help you stabilize. And then you have to learn to stay on it. And if you don't stay on it, we got to, you know, then you're going to go back out on the streets. So we got to figure out how to how to deal with that component. But but we're trying. As a, as, a, as a legislator to try to change things. I can go into a lot more depth. No, of course. 19, uh, uh, 1967 uh, uh, with the Lanterman Petra uh, Short Act. But. It's, I mean, those sorts of things are, are exactly the challenge that we face, right? Because on one hand, you have you know, individual rights that you're trying to protect. Right. Um, and mental illness is certainly something that I'm very familiar with. The challenges that are created when you don't, you don't have the ability to effectively put you know, medical power of attorney in the hands of a responsible individual and force somebody to seek treatment. It, right. It can also be abused quite badly. I, I don't want to end on that note, and I also don't want to end on this next one, but I do want to make sure we get it in. We talked about this idea of transparency, right? And so trying to understand how much things cost. You introduced a bill that made it through both houses in, in the state uh, in the last year that was simply designed to introduce XBRL, the, the uh, language, so that the information, the financial information in California's budgets was easily and transparently available in a digital form. What happened? Well, it was vetoed by Governor Newsom. Um, and tragically, I, you know, it takes me weeks, months to get 482 cities' comprehensive annual financial reports. But if they were all required to, 
to enter that information for, let's say, the treasurer's office or the controller's office, what I do is I take their unrestricted net position divided by their population to kind of get a metric of, you know, what kind of, what's your temperature? Where are you? You're, you're, you're positive, negative, uh, and where do you fit in the range? It takes us weeks, months, but if I had XBRL, I could do it in seconds. One other quick question on a related topic, right? The um, CalPERS, which we've talked a lot about, has a new CIO or a relatively new CIO, and he's come under fire for investments in China. I would personally castigate him for his decision to eliminate all active managers, so they've gone with a strictly passive approach. As a legislator, as, as someone elected to represent Californians, what can you do in relation to that type of dynamic? Not much. You know, the, you have a retirement board. It oversees the investment policy statement. And there are studies that show that passive investing may be better than active. Active is interesting because you're paying someone a lot of money and you're going, why am I just not paying them for the alpha instead of, you know, if they're just meeting the benchmarks, what, what am I getting? You know, and so I, I, you can see this trend going where a lot of people are in the investment arena are saying, Let, let's just go passive. Uh, and then you get into fees, you know, the whole, the whole gambit. So a passive account is a lot cheaper than hiring a, you know, a, a, a good group of smart people that are investing your money. You know, and, and at the end of the day, who knows who's right? Yeah. But, but there are, there's at least some empirical data that says maybe you ought to go this way. But I mean, even Cal Perry, they're, 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 it's run by human beings, right? Yep. They, they thought that Hillary Clinton was gonna win, so they lowered their investment allocation in the equity markets, and they lost a billion dollars within a few months after uh, President Trump was elected. So, you know, these opportunity costs, they get real expensive. Well, I think that's one of the fun things, right? I mean, just like you didn't know for certain that Bob Citroen was gonna blow up, but you certainly yeah. had concerns about the way it was exposed. I would suggest I have concerns. I don't know that it's gonna blow up, but I have a lot of concerns that I believe are well-placed in terms of passive investing. This has been such an honor to sit down with you, uh, Senator Mark, and it is really, really my pleasure to have you here. I'd love to be able to come back at some point in the future and sit down and talk with you again. That'd be fun. Excellent, Please. thank you very much. Thank you.